which feels kind of crazy, but feels kind of possible, but feels kind of crazy, but I kind of hope it happens. Why am I so bad at this? Riley Sager, super fan here. I feel like if you know, you know, did a great job twisting things on me, audio narrating it. Is that even how you say it? He just, just, he does, he just does. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to part one of what I read in May. So I read 10 books all together in May. We're gonna do a five and five because I of course have so many things to say. So let's not waste any time. Let's get into the books. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right in with the one that I am so super excited about, which is The Only One Left by Riley Sager. So if you guys saw my June most anticipated books, you would have heard me cry about the fact that I didn't have an arc of this book, and then you would have seen a pop-up that I wound up getting an e-arc of this book from NetGalley, which I was so freaking excited about, and of course, immediately read it, and I immediately wanna talk all about it. Spoiler free, as always. So, Riley Sager, super fan here. I love everything he does. I have such an affection for him and his writing. So I would say take it with a grain of salt, but obviously if I didn't like something, I would tell you guys that too. But I really enjoyed this book. So this one, I feel like as usual, best served going into it a little bit in the dark. So this is called A Gothic Chiller. And it's so funny, I've been listening to the Criminal Types podcast with Abby from Crime by the Book. And she was talking about the word, like describing a book as a chiller. And she was like, I don't know. I feel like it was Abby. Like she was like, I don't think I coined it, but like, I'm not sure who coined it. And I feel like maybe she was talking to CJ Tudor at the time and they were talking about where that word got coined. And then all of a sudden it pops up in the Riley book too. So you guys know in my, if you've watched me or indulged <laughs> me when I talk about him, one of my favorite things about him is that his books kind of dance that line between thriller and horror and there's always like a bit of mystique and what's really going on here that he has cooking in his books. So this one is set in 1983 which I absolutely love to begin with and it is set in a coastal town in Maine and it is this mansion on top of a cliffside which is kind of one of the central characters of the book in so many ways and the mansion is called Hope's End. So in this book, we are meeting a caregiver named Kit McDear, and she got a new assignment for a new patient. And she is assigned to take care of the 71 year old woman named Lenora Hope, who has suffered from multiple strokes. She's confined to a wheelchair. She only has the use of her left hand. And her only way of communicating with Kit is through a typewriter that she can kind of very slowly type messages on. And the hitch with Lenora, is back in 1929, she was suspected to be the perpetrator of a Lizzie Borden type crime in that her entire family was massacred. And while the police suspected Lenora heavily, there was never any proof and she was never convicted. But Lenora has never stepped foot outside of Hope's End since that night, and she has never spoken of that night. But now she's feeling a bit of a kindred connection to Kit, and she is ready to tell her story. So Kit, in some ways it's an offer she can't refuse, but it's kind of also be careful what you wish for. So I just loved it so much. I just had such a fun time with this book. From a feelings standpoint, compared to other Riley Sager books, I would say this most reminds me of Home Before Dark, which is, you guys know, Final Girls is always gonna be like top tier for me. Nothing will unseat that book, but Home Before, Home Before Dark is like right there with it. I compulsively read that book in a couple of days. I did the exact same thing with The Only One Left. I couldn't wait to get back into it. I had all the thoughts and ideas, and I feel like he did a great job with his breadcrumbs. I feel like he get, did a great job twisting things on me. There was something at one point in the book that I was like, there's a part of me that really hopes X happens which feels kind of crazy, but feels kind of possible, but feels kind of crazy, but I kind of hope it happens. And I was super happy when something I wanted to have happen actually happened in a book. <laughs> you know, when you just like, you kind of create your own plot lines or you create your own stories in some way. So something I wanted to happen actually happened in the book. So I'm super jazzed about it. And I just had such a fun time with it. So you guys, I do love him so much. I will always recommend his books. I do think there's a Riley Sager for everybody. But I think if you really enjoyed Home Before Dark, I think this is definitely up your alley. 
I also think if you are new to Riley Sager or maybe kind of want to get back into him or maybe have like dipped in and out of the pool. I also think The Only One Left is a great way to be introduced to him as a writer. He just, just, he does, he just does. He just does such a great job, I feel like, of pulling the reader in from the start. I enjoy his characters. I love the feeling of when I'm in a Riley book and I know I'm in a Riley book and no two books for me are ever the same, but the feeling I have, like I know where I am. I know I'm in one of his books. So this one's gonna be out, I wanna say June 20th, fact check right here. And I just highly, hugely recommend it. So my pre-order is on its way. I can't wait for it to come. I tabbed up and highlighted the heck out of my ebook. And <laughs> I'm so super excited. So thank you again, Nat Kelly. Thank you again, Dutton. Thank you again, Riley Sager absolutely absolutely made my day and I loved it so much so there you go had to talk about it okay so let's pivot into two books that couldn't be more different than Riley Sager but that are slightly similar to each other so I'm going to talk about them separately yet together in some ways so the first book is my Oxford year by Julia Whalen which I listened to the audiobook of Julia Whalen herself does the audio narration so you can't go wrong and then the other book is One Italian Summer by Rebecca Searle which I also wound up doing the audiobook of because Lauren Graham aka Lorelai Gilmore did the audiobook narration and I really wanted to hear her so I want to talk about these books together because in a lot of ways I went into both of them blind and they both took turns I wasn't expecting and I really enjoyed them and also both of these books completely wrecked me but also gave me like all the warm and fuzzy feelings that like not at the same time but like eventually I was both like broken and put back together again with both of these books so let's talk about my Oxford year first because I just finished it yesterday and I was listening to a podcast with Julia Whalen and Emily Henry because Julia Whalen narrates her books and Julia Whalen was talking about how she felt like Happy Place was the book she needed at the time and they were talking about how my Oxford year was sort of a book she needed at the time so I was like I have that book I need to read it let's go so this book is about a girl named Ella Duran who has a Rhodes Scholarship scholarship <laughs> it's a Rhodes Scholar and she goes to Oxford for a year. So when Ella was 13 years old, she read a story in Seventeen magazine about this girl who had gone to Oxford. And ever since then, it has been Ella's dream. So when the book opens, she's 24. She's literally getting off the plane at Heathrow. And she is set out to have an adventure of a lifetime for the next year. And literally, when she gets off this plane, she also gets a phone call. And she winds up getting this dream job back in the States, working for an up and coming political candidate. And she kind of strikes this agreement where she's going to go to Oxford, she's going to work remotely, and she will be back in the States in June. And off she goes to like live best year ever. And of course, she runs into the charming yet obnoxious yet completely gorgeous James Davenport. On her first day there, they have a terrible first encounter, not a meet cute in any kind of way. She basically can't stand him. And then sure enough, he winds up being her English professor at Oxford and shenanigans and hijinks and such ensue. So I did not read the back of this book. I did not know much about it. I thought it was going to be very rom-com-y. This book has a lot of weightiness to it. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I feel like let the story unfold. But I was so surprised, more so in the fact, not that it wasn't organic to the story, but because I just didn't know. <laughs> I thought it was going to be something totally different. And I really, really loved it. And I feel like this is one of those books that kind of whether you are at the point in your life you're trying to reassess things or you think you have everything figured out and I don't feel like this is just like reserved for people who are 24 years old but I think taking that step back rethinking things questioning everything you thought you knew questioning just sort of all sorts of things letting your walls down keeping your walls up why you are the way you are how your past impacts your present and I had thought this was going one way because there are some allusions to things and I really enjoyed where this book went. I thought some of the characters were so wonderfully funny. I found great humor in this book. I think a lot of that is due to Julia Whalen herself audio narrating it. Is that even how you say it? She just has such a gift, which I think anyone who's listened to her 
period would know but hearing her listen like hearing her tell her own story really had such an impact it's kind of like when Marion Keys did Rachel's Holiday I feel like I listened to the story the way it was meant to be heard and I just thoroughly enjoyed it I was wrecked I was crying I was laughing and I just had such an unexpected good time with it like I thought it would be good I didn't know it was going to touch me in so many ways personally and I just really had a fun time with it. I highly recommend it. I do feel like, you know, proceed with caution if you're not looking to be emotionally wrecked right now, which goes with this book too. But I thought it was really good. I would say it's predominantly a closed door romance. There is one scene where I feel like the door is half open <laughs> and it closes, but it's not steamy in any kind of a way. There's definitely some romance to this. There's some family drama to this. There are some great sidekick friends. And there's just, like I said, like some great humor and just sort of some great unexpected turns in this book. And I really enjoyed it. So I'm so glad I finally read it. I don't remember what I was talking about and this could have been like a month or two ago I feel like her name came up when I was talking about audiobook narrations and somebody had told me like I need to read this book so I finally read it I'm very excited about it so that's the first book that destroyed me the second book that destroyed me is One Italian Summer by Rebecca Searle so if you guys saw the vlog I did a couple of weeks ago I was reading this I had intentionally decided to read this over Mother's Day weekend because this is about a woman and her relationship with her mom I should have known that this was going to wreck me, but I kind of didn't. I don't know. I, I just, I underestimated how wrecked I was going to be. So in this book, we know on page one, Katie is sitting Shiva for her mom. We know her mom has passed away and she's having a really, really hard time with it. So Katie and her mom were supposed to take this magical trip to Positano. Her mother had spent a magical summer there when she was younger, before she met Katie's dad. And Katie wanted to live that with her. And she's heard about her mom talk about it so many times. So they made a plan to go. And unfortunately, her mom winds up passing away just a few weeks before they're supposed to leave for the trip. So Katie ultimately decides to go alone. So she is married. She is leaving her dad at home. She just wants to do this on her own by herself. And when she gets there, it's like everything and more than she could have possibly imagined. It's beautiful. She's embarking on this trip. Her and her mom had an itinerary. They had a plan. And she's just so struck by how amazing everything is. And then one morning she winds up meeting a woman who is her mother, Carol, when Carol is 30 years old. And she winds up spending her time with her mother in a very magical realism way, which is what Rebecca saw. Rebecca Searle does if you guys follow her. So I very much enjoyed this book. The sort of Katie has the knowledge of her mother and her past and is having this moment with her mom that I don't know about you guys but I mean like how amazing would that be and I just really maybe like put things in perspective and think about things and there's just so much emotion and weight to this which I feel like is kind of a given given the storyline and I really enjoyed it and it was like it was warm and it was heartbreaking and it was beautiful and it was hard. and my battery died while I was going down that whole path of emotion so I probably look like I'm in a different spot I totally look like I'm in a different spot but I feel like it goes without saying but I will say it again this definitely deals very heavily with grief and loss and I don't know if it's just me or I feel like I've been in this place for ever but I love a book with someone who's a little bit messy who's a little bit lost who is trying to just figure themselves out and really take a look at their life 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 and reassess and rethink and I think it's a it's kind of a blend of like appreciating things for what they are and wondering what life you're living and who are you living it for and are you living the life you want to be living and I just really really enjoyed it and I mean, no doubt Lauren Graham completely elevated this book in so many different ways. And I just really loved it. And I know when I talked about it in my vlog, you know, this book didn't work for everybody and not everybody loves it. And that's totally cool. Not here to convince you to read a book. Not here to convince you this book is for everybody. But this book was definitely for me. It was the right time. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, the writing. I enjoyed the storytelling. I enjoyed the relationship between Katie and Carol. And I just really thought she did a great job with it. So I'm very glad I read it. And I highly recommend it if it sounds like it's the right book for you guys. I highly recommend it because I thought it was great. And kind of on that note, so when I read 
in five years last year or two years ago. I feel like this was pitched a little bit like romance and it's really about best friends. And I feel like this is really like a love story between a mother and a daughter. So I really enjoy how Rebecca Searle does her love stories in that way because I feel like there is so much love in such a different way, duh, between a romantic partnership versus a friendship versus parent-child. And I really love how she describes that love. So, hmm also cried when I read that book, which is probably pretty obvious. So let's wipe away the tears and talk about something dark again. So again, if you saw my May, no, vlog, if you saw the vlog I did in May, <laughs> I was also talking about I Didn't Do It by Jamie Lynn Hendricks. I left you guys on a little bit of a cliffhanger and that I told you I finished it, but I wasn't going to tell you what I thought about it. But I kind of feel like it was obvious through that vlog that I loved it. And I loved it. I loved it. This is the second Jamie Lynn Hendricks book that I have read. I will say this takes place at a fictional thriller fest called Murder Palooza. As I am filming this, it is thriller fest and I am clearly not there. I just couldn't swing it this year between work and everything else and it was not my year. I'll be back in 2024. I'm definitely having all the FOMO but watching everybody else's content but I'm not here to talk about Thriller Fest. We're here to talk about Jamie Lynn Hendricks. So this is a murder that takes place at a thriller conference and a very famous author winds up getting stabbed to death in her hotel room when the book opens. So four other authors who are at this event wind up getting brought together because they become the subject of some anonymous threats and they each get these anonymous texts that are sort of like, you could be next. And there is this <laughs> vicious Twitter account that is kind of coming for them and kind of threatening to reveal all of their secrets. So the four of them wind up working together to try and figure out what the heck is going on. Very much in a case of who better to solve a murder than people who write them for a living. And everybody's got secrets and there's all sorts of stuff going on and things just start to come out. And there's so much great inside baseball, inside publishing to this behind the curtain. There's a lot of, I'm sure, tongue in cheek things about the publishing industry. I am sure there are things that are very factual that are in here. And I really enjoyed, I love books about writers and the writing life. And I really enjoyed sort of how she played with all of that in this book. And they're in New York City, they're running around, they're in this hotel. And having been to Thriller Fest, I feel like I could so easily visualize everything that was going on here from the hotel and the bar and the setting and the awards ceremony. And I just thought it was such great fun. So I read her second book. We do this, we, me, every time because I read the UK edition, which is a different name than the US edition. So I read, why am I so bad at this? And why don't they put the names of people's books in the front of the book? I read It Could Be Anyone, which was her husband's murder, which is about a groom who winds up getting murdered on page one at his wedding reception. And the bride and her circle of friends are all there. And the circle of friends all pretty much hate the groom and everyone has a motive to kill him. So we get everybody's motives. We go back in time a couple of days for the, like the, the destination wedding weekend. I thoroughly enjoyed that book so, so much. And then her first book, Finding Tessa, I have, but I haven't read yet. So I'm going to be reading that on the sooner side, but I really enjoy her writing. I enjoy her characters. I think she has fun with her books, but she writes kind of quick, fast paced, interesting characters, interesting story, interesting mystery. And I just really enjoyed it. And I a thousand percent am biased with the fact that the Thriller Writer Conference hooked me so much and I loved that aspect of it so much but also thoroughly enjoyed the book so much. So very excited for this one. Very excited for Jamie Lynn Hendricks. Very bummed I'm missing her panel but like I said next year. Next year. And then the last book I have I actually had an e-arc of it also but but I listened to the audiobook <laughs> because I just, I'm still having a hard time reading you guys. This is What Have We Done by Alex Finley. So there are four audiobook narrators. I just wanted to get my computer so I can get this right. Brittany Presley, James Patrick Cronin, John Lindstrom, and Maggie Thompson. Everyone will be down below as always. So this is, maybe that was obvious, a multi-POV, multi-character audiobook that we have going on here. And this is his third book as Alex Finley. 
So this follows a group of former friends, I would say. So 25 years ago, Jenna, Donnie, and Nico were residents of Savior House, which was a group home for parentless teens. And when the home was shut down after the disappearance of several kids, all three of them were split up. And over the years, they completely lost touch. But now somebody seems to be amped on revealing some stuff that happened back then. And the three of them wind up being on the wrong end of somebody's threats. And they need to figure out what's going on. So this one kind of has the party line of it's a reunion none of them asked for or wanted, but it may be the only way to save all of their lives. So they are forced to confront the past. They are forced to revisit the past. And this one is crazy town, you guys. So if you have followed me for a bit, then you know Every Last Fear, his first book, was one of my faves. I absolutely loved it. It had a true crime documentary angle to it. It had some past and present timelines. We had a whole family that mysteriously died and one of the sons had to figure out what happened. And it was the reluctant return home. And I mean, there was just so much going on in that book in such a great way, but I loved it. It was a family story. There was murder mystery and I had such a great time with it. And I don't know if this is because I'm suffering a little bit from, you know, if you read like a lot of books in the same genre or maybe sometimes by the same author, you have like a little bit of burnout. I feel like I'm having high octane thriller burnout right now. So I read this early in the month. It might've even been like the first or second book I finished in May. And I just feel like it was, it's like, if you're looking for edge of your seat, action packed, like crazy town twists and turns, like just all the things, wild ride of a book, this is the one for you. I thought it was gonna be more like Every Last Fear, where it was a little bit more twisty thrillery, but it definitely was just like, I could see this as a movie, kind of like wildness type of a thing. So it wasn't that it wasn't a good book. I feel like it wasn't the right book for me at the time. So I enjoyed it in the sense that like, I wanted to know what was gonna happen next. I kind of, at some point, I just surrendered to the crazy because I was like, <laughs> this is nuts. Like, what is happening here? This is nuts. Then I'm like, this is a crazy book. This is a no exit kind of book. This is just throw all things out the window, surrender to the crazy and just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. So that's what I wound up doing. So I did enjoy it. I did have a decent time with it, but I personally love the Every Last Fear style book more than I like the High Octane Crazy. And I don't know if, and this is me just like spitballing and making stuff up, but I feel like when No Exit happened, it was just such a phenomenon. And I mean, I read it later than everybody else because I was a little bit like, hmm. And I read it and then I loved it. And I was like, this is like crazy town. Like that was another one of those like compulsive reads kind of a thing. I talked about it when I read The Last Word by Taylor Adams. And I very much enjoyed that book, which was also like, these were all kind of stacked up together. And I really enjoyed The Last Word, but I almost feel like when No Exit came out, you know how they say like, don't chase trends. I feel like a whole bunch of people maybe wrote High Octane or maybe a whole bunch of people were like, this is amazing, I wanna write this too. Or this is amazing, this is the kind of book I wanna read. And I feel like a whole bunch of them have come out kind of together or I have read them together. So I just feel like a little bit burnt out and it was just wild. Like it just felt like motion picture kind of crazy. So does it make it bad? But I wanted less crazy. I wanted less crazy. And this was also one of those books where a character makes a choice that I do feel like was a choice that was not the right choice. And not in a, I would never do that, but like choices were made and it was so uh, like obvious to me, like this is going, this is gonna have some repercussions to it and that it was done so that repercussions could come from it kind of a thing. I feel like if you know, you know. Um, feel free to DM me if you want to talk about it. Don't spoil it down below. <laughs> but anyway, it was just sort of like wild town kind of a thing. So there you go. That is my crazy one to end this video on. But I have some romance when we come back. I have another, I would not totally crazy, but a little crazy. And then I don't know if this is like a teaser that's going to get you guys to come back, but I read book four in the Joe Goldberg series. So I have thoughts and feelings on Joe. 
I just, my inappropriate Joe Goldberg crush lives on. But I'll talk more about the book in the next video. So let me know if you guys read any of these. Let me know your thoughts and feelings on Crazy Town Books. Is it just me? Is it just me? Could just be me. But did you read anything amazing this month? Are you looking forward to anything amazing? I don't know why I give you guys prompts of what to talk about. Talk about whatever the heck you guys want to talk about down below. And we will connect down there. So until next time, my friends, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for being here. And I will see you in the next video whenever it comes out. And hopefully you'll be there too. So take care, everybody. Bye.